Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Congressman Raul Grijalva talks about immigration and other Capitol Hill concerns. We'll hear about efforts to improve a section of freeway that carries a lot of the valley's traffic. And the ASU Art Museum's spring season starts this week. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A federal judge in Texas blocks President Obama's deferred deportation plan. This as the plan itself plays a factor in a congressional fight over funding the Homeland of Security, the Homeland Security Department. Joining us now is Democratic Congressman Raul Grijalva, who represents the state's third congressional district in southern Arizona. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, I did a little stumble there because it's kind of hard to put the twos and twos together regarding the injunction and the Department of Homeland Security. We'll start with the injunction. Your thoughts on the Texas judge's decision? Well, I think his decision and his restraining injunction to not to not put into the effect uh, the the parental part of uh, of the executive order. I think it's short lived. You know, uh, this judge had a predisposition uh, on record, both in public and in legal uh, decisions and in public comments toward uh, the executive order. Uh, against it, uh, public comments regarding immigration as a whole, and you know, there was a convenient shopping on the part of the Attorney General in Texas to find that judge in South Texas. The fact remains he never ruled on the constitutionality because that's the weak ground. I think the appeal by the Obama administration is going to be rapid and quick. Or it'll be overturned. And people that are now scared or losing enthusiasm and confused should continue to put the papers that they need together, the data they need together, because I'm convinced that at the end of the day, like every other executive action by any president, it'll be within the constitutional authority of the president and this decision will be overturned. The judge uh, wrote that uh, the president legislated substantial rule without complying with procedural requirements, not taking public comment and those sorts of things. Does he have a point? No, no, that uh, th that's the narrow judgment that he made that it might cost Texas additional money to issue license, that it might cost Arizona additional money. Uh, that's the procedural point he made that there should have been public comment. This is an executive order. And, and as such, previous executive orders on immigration from George Bush to Ronald Reagan uh, on to Johnson have all, have all been executive. There has been no public comment. That, that, that is the narrow weak link of the decision on which he based everything else and the restraining order. That's why we feel once the constitutionality is tested, uh, the authority will be affirmed. And standing still has to be tested as well, does it not? Well, it, in, in its entirety, yes. Yes. And the ability of states to preempt what is constitutionally a federal responsibility immigration. A couple of quotes from the congressional delegation uh, on the Republican side. Uh, Congressman Salmon, this defends the ability of Congress, of Congress, of you, to set policy. Does he have a point? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting with Salmon. He, he'll also, he'll also uh, uh, rattle the saber uh, and say that the president should have open-ended authority when it comes to ISIS and we should put troops on the ground. There should be no restraint on the president. He's fine with that part of his executive authority. When it comes to immigration, then he begins to talk about states' rights and the predominance of, uh, er, of, of Congress to make those decisions. Congress needs to reform immigration. That's their responsibility, codified into law. The fact that that has not been done in the House of Representatives lays at the feet of the Republicans. We have all been willing to move forward with the Senate bill for two years, and yet no action. And yet Republican uh, Representative Gosar says that this stops the president's lawlessness, his words, and abolishes the president's precedent of ruling by executive fiat against the will of the American people. A lot of folks agree with that sentiment. How do you respond? I, you know, I, I really think that when the president takes action in creating monuments in some regulatory issues regarding beginning to address the issue of climate change, which is real and can't be denied, that I think he's acting in the best interest of the people. And the, the majority of the American people support doing something about climate change. And the issue of immigration, even here in Arizona, a small majority of Arizonans believe that there should be a path to legalization. You know, fiat, executive fiat, like I said, the, 
Gosar and Salmon and speak out of both sides of their mouth. On one end, they're comfortable with the president conducting a war without congressional authority. And on one hand, when it comes to immigration, they second guess every step of the way. Do you think the president should be able to conduct no, a I war don't. without congressional authority? No, we've seen the movie. Uh, the unilateral action by Bush in Iraq, then that expanded into Afghanistan 13, 14 years later, uh, trillions, $2 trillion in our treasury, 5,000 of our, our, our blood of American soldiers. No, I think that this is something Congress in the War Powers Act has the right to do and we should. Uh, I, I think we need to defeat ISIS. It is a contorted look at Islam and Muslims, and that needs to be stopped, the cruelty and the atrocities. But it has to be, there has to be a timetable, and America must supply all the resources to win this and destroy this organization. But the frontline troops and the responsibility for, falls on Arab nations and the Muslim world to turn this catastrophe. We can lead from behind. We don't need to be the policeman in the front. So uh, a, a drafting by the president submitted to Congress, maybe limiting the authority, the, the authority to go to war every three years or so, considering we're seeing beheadings and people burning, we're seeing absolute barbarism over there. And it sounds like there is a groundswell to do something about it. What do you do? I think, you, I, I think that I believe firmly that we should do everything within our power to support and make sure that the region is engaged in this war. This cannot become United States war on ISIS. Are they cruel? Are they inhumane? The American people feel that way, and I believe the majority of the Arab world feels the same way. They need to be engaged in that ground troop, in that ground war. American boots on the ground has to be an option that for now needs to be off the table. Okay, and for now off the table, if the rest of the world just simply doesn't do it, do we have to do it? Is that America's place in the world? I don't know if America's place in the world is constant to be its policeman. I don't, uh, and I think we need to re-examine what our role is in, internationally. We can lead, but we don't have to be the policeman in the front. I, I mentioned Homeland Security and how that uh, coincided with the president's uh, executive action on immigration. It sounds as though funding for Homeland Security is wrapped up in that action and that some in Congress are basically saying, uh, you got like eight days until the Department of Homeland Security could be partially shut down, if not completely shut down. How are you guys going to fix this? Because the Republicans want that immigration order coinciding with funding for Department of Homeland Security. How are you going to get around that? I don't know how we get around it. Simple issue is even the Senate, majority of the Republicans in the Senate, have indicated to leadership in the House, we need to pass a clean bill. We've passed since 9-11, since, since the formation of Homeland Security, one clean bill after another with no attached amendments or, or political amendments that were added to it around the issue of immigration. You know, this is time that Boehner needs to step up in the greater good the greater good being the security of the American people, and to, for once, ignore the rattling of that hardcore Tea Party caucus that he has in his caucus and move forward. A clean bill, Democrats will support it. A clean bill, the president will sign it. That's what we've done in the past under Bush, under Bar Barack Obama. This became a convenient vehicle to try to deal with the issue of immigration, and I, and I think it's the wrong vehicle, and we're jeopardizing, playing Russian roulette, with the American people's security, uh, that's on the Republicans' hands. It's not about us giving in. We've said we'll vote for a clean bill. But I also hear from Republicans who basically say they now have this authority, they now have the power uh, to ask for, to push for these kinds of uh, additions to legislation. They're saying this is setting a precedent for how it's going to be. Uh, and it is a dangerous precedent. If the precedent is to do clean legislation around the most important issue that we're facing at this juncture, which is the national domestic security of the American people, and this is the one we're going to use as a vehicle to try to make the political statement that we're in charge, when in the past, regardless of who was in the majority, and Democrats were on occasion, it passed cleanly. It's the wrong vehicle, the wrong message, and very dangerous precedent they're setting. Gut feeling, Homeland Security. It's, it, it's going to get funded. Eight days, it's going to get funded. I really believe that. I don't think, uh, I think it's going to be a clean bill. And I, and, and I think the Republicans are going to use the excuse of the injunctions to say it's being dealt with in the courts. Let's pass a clean bill. They cannot afford to have a, to have a shutdown of any part of Homeland Security 
at, on their lap. I can't let you go without the dedication of the Goldwater statue yeah. back there. You actually spoke and you said some kind words about, I, I think some folks were a little bit surprised considering the political spectrum. Yeah, well, you know, I, well, Mr. Conservative, Barry Goldwater, but I very much in, the, uh, in Arizona tradition, uh, the independent, principled, and spoke his mind, uh, regardless of the consequences. Uh, I, I think that's an Arizona tradition. Plus, pro-women's rights, pro-gay rights, and very, as he left, warning the American people and his colleagues in the Senate, be careful with the military-industrial complex. They're beginning to have too much control over the budget and the foreign policy of this nation. So even Mr. Conservative would sometimes go against his own wind. Congressman, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank My you so much My pleasure to be here. Us. The spine is a major section of the I-17 and I-10 corridor that carries almost half of the Phoenix area's freeway traffic, but the spine needs to be updated. And for more on that, we welcome Bob Hazlett, Senior Engineering Project Manager for the Maricopa Association of Governments. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for asking us to be here. Uh, where exactly and what exactly is the spine? <laughs> well, the spine is the what we call the central nervous system to the entire freeway system, and it is actually Interstate 10 and Interstate 17 that begins up north at where I-17 meets Loop 101 at the North Stack and then it extends down about 35 miles as kind of seen on screen right here all the way down to Loop 202, uh, the Santan and the future South Mountain Freeway, the Pecos Stack. So it's that entire quarter and that's more than likely if about 40 percent of the traffic finds its way onto that every day. And now you are working on a master plan to improve the spine? How? Yes. Um, one of the things is is that uh, first off we're still growing as a community here in the valley i mean we're gonna our, our per current population projections are we're going to grow to about six million a little bit over six million people by 2040 and so we've got more folks coming in uh, we have some known congestion issues and what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what we can do to address a lot of these traffic issues um, widening may not be the answer, but widening may be the answer. And what we're really looking for is for public comment and public input on this, because uh, again, uh, we don't want to just widen just to wide for widening's sake. And again, when you're talking about future needs, are you talking about business interests? Are you talking about faster commutes? What are you talking about? I think it's about all the above, because uh, when you think about how much traffic is, is on the spine from a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's people that are commuting to their businesses, it's uh, people that are going to schools, it's people going for shopping, it's people there for social trips. It's, it's just all kinds of folks that are there, and it's also, of course, our public transportation users as well. So we have a lot of folks that use this quarter depend on it on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there an effort as well to connect neighborhoods to make sure the spine doesn't become divisive, for lack of a better word? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's always been talk about uh, widening these freeway quarters, and some past studies have even tried to look at that. And all we find is, is that we're just creating a giant wall, if you will, between neighborhoods. And I believe what we want to do here is, is not only just look at improving your traffic experience up and down Interstates 10 and 17, but we want to make certain that people can get to that corridor, that they can get on and off that corridor, and also get across the corridor because there's a lot of places where people are having problems getting across. Uh, name your road, Camelback or Indian School or down south at uh, Chandler Boulevard or Ray Road. People are having problems getting across and so we want to make certain that folks can have that connectivity. Uh, uh, 
I know you're looking around the areas, as you mentioned, around the freeways too. Mm -hmm. um, was, were there environmental studies involved with this and what, what was found? Or? Yeah, previously um, there were two environmental studies that went on that, that took a look at a lot of the different issues. And what we found is, is that, yes, we do have some environmental concerns that we always have to be working through. And this study, of course, will address those as best as we can. We'll take into account what has been studied before. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that we want to do is, is we just want to make certain that we can get something that can keep this as the backbone of the entire transportation system. And uh, again, we want folks to come to these public meetings and give us a, 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 an advice and, and, and a shout out as to what we should do here. As far as money, uh, how much money of the master plan? Sounds, a master plan sounds like big bucks. Oh, absolutely. Um, the master plan right now is in a, it's about a 30 month process and we're roughly about eight months into it. Uh, but the regional transportation plan that the Maricopa Association of Governments does that kind of plans out our entire freeway system for, or actually our entire transportation system for the next uh, 20 plus years. Uh, it has money program, uh, roughly about a billion and a half dollars to be able to improve this quarter. And so we have a lot of uh, capital out there, if you will, to be able to do some things. And some of those things, we're gonna try and uh, address some of those no bottlenecks right now. Right. Uh, we've got a near-term improvement strategy to help the Broadway curve out, to help out folks as they're getting south of uh, Baseline Road down the Pecos stack, trying to get those types of things working and get those sooner than later. Okay, so someone's listening, watching right now, they're saying, hey, I wanna make a comment because I don't like X, Y, or Z, or I wanna see A, B, or C. How do they do it? Okay, there's a couple of ways they can do it. First off, spine.azmag.gov. You don't have to put the www in front of it. Uh, if you just go to that site, uh, that'll give you information on where to go for our public meetings that we're happening. We have, uh, since the quarter's 35 miles long, we have one up north, one in the center, one in the south. Uh, so those are all happening over the next two weeks. We also have a very interactive tool that folks can use. It kind of uses a internet gaming, if you will. It's called uh, MetroQuest, where folks can actually tap on that and be able to give us their thoughts and their opinions. It's a very interactive tool, allows you to be able to look on a map and pinpoint where you think the problems are, tell us whether you want to uh, add more lanes or whether or not you want to uh, add more special lanes for public transportation, or whether you want to add more lanes or, or abilities for bikes to get back and forth. That website, one more time? Spine.azmag.gov. Spine.azmag.gov, and you can just do whatever you want, just uh, to your heart's content. Huh? Exactly, and this, right. this, this tool is there, and uh, we're very excited about it, and we encourage folks to, uh, to be a part of it. All right, Bob, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at the ASU Art Museum spring season, which kicks off tomorrow. Here to tell us about what will be exhibited is the curator, Julio Cesar Morales, and artists, Scott Kiernan and Victoria Ketty. Good to have you all, like all of you here. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. We appreciate it. Um, let's, in general terms now, yes. the ASU are how many museums, what purpose do they serve? It's a university museum. It's the, it's the ASU Art Museum, and uh, tomorrow we have our season opener.
So we have five exhibitions opening and including the uh, brickyard where our ceramic research center is as well. So the brickyard is one spot and the other and one is... And then the other one is the actual museum that's on campus on, in, on Tempe. And the goal of a university art museum is what? I think the actual goal of the university art museum is to actually take risks within art. But also since ASU is such a large research center and, and university, we try and work with artists that are really interested in, in working with these other um, schools within the school itself other than the museum and in collaboration. Okay, so we got uh, we got six exhibitions featured, correct? Yes. The first one, one two, three, four, five. Yes. Is that six? Okay, mm, I there you think go. So. Uh, the first one is yes. this live videotaping with ESP TV. All right. What is ESP TV? Uh, ESP TV is a project that's existed for nearly five years, and it's basically um, a traveling TV studio that travels to different galleries, DIY spaces, any kind of space really, and collaborates with artists to make to make live television in the space. So it's in some ways it's a bit like this, and in some ways it's absolutely nothing <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the projects, you know, range from. Um, performance art, uh, musicians, video artists all become part of a live taping with a live audience. We broadcast the show on television in Manhattan, in New York, and in uh, uh, Philadelphia and Portland occasionally. And then after that, they go online. So they're viewable from our website. And Victoria, as, as far as television is concerned, obviously you, you can be live, you can be taped, you can at times be both. Uh, is this one of those live events that is preserved by tape, or does it? Does it? Or you not even bother taping it? No, we do. We um, we preserve everything. Um, it, our experience is very much about the live televisual experience, but we also come at um, come from a standpoint where we look to preserve everything, and we do. We record everything to tape. Um, it's it's kind of a living archive as well as a, a very a live experience at now, the same time. Do you work with local, you'll be working with local artists here, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and everywhere you go, you work with local artists? Or is it, because you mentioned it was a traveling situation. It is, I mean, we some, you know, for the exhibition um, here in Arizona, we're bringing some videos from artists from different parts of the country, but the artists that are performing at the show, I mean, and we're also showing videos from artists in Phoenix, and then we're also having performances by artists, you know, from Phoenix, Arizona. Yep. And we're, we're looking at some of your work right now. Yes. As, as someone who's involved mm -hmm. with the museum, you see this, you hear about this. Yes. Why are you interested in this? I'm interested because this is part of an overall exhibition called Unfixed. And Unfixed really looks at the history of painting. It's a painting show, but it's artists who are influenced by both analog and digital technology. And at the same time, I think when you ask if things are taped, they uh, ESP TV tapes on VHS. Mm -hmm. So the live sessions are recorded on VHS and then they're digitized in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so this exhibition called Unfix is really about artists, you know, a, a new term called post-internet art. Yeah. You know, and, and the idea is I, I actually posed the question within the essay that I wrote, you know, and, and I end with saying, what does it mean to be a painter in a post-internet environment? Wow. Holy smokes, we could do a whole <laughs> show on that. I mean, okay. But again, you're talking technology, and you know, it's one thing to do art with you know, minerals and soils and natural right. things. You're doing art with stuff that could be obsolete in another six months to a year. How do you get around that? How do you work with that? Well, I mean, obsolete is a thing that is usually used to sell products. I mean, the thing is that, yes, obsolete means one thing, but it doesn't mean it stopped working. And part of our ethos of working is that, and I think that ties in with some of the things with the show, is that there's not really any rules. You know, you can use anything if it suits what you're trying to do. And sometimes you might appreciate the texture of something that's 30 years old, and you might combine it with something that's from two weeks ago. Mm. You know, there's a way to mix and match. There's no rules on that. Well, it, it, with that in mind, is there, can, can you get too much technology involved? Can it be too clean? Can it be too perfect? I think so. I think a lot of our practice is about deconstructing the ideas of maybe the perfect setting, the perfect um, set of technologies. Um, the idea of high definition, breaking that kind of apart, what does that mean and, and how useful is it for their practice um, from an artist standpoint. And so yeah, we, we kind of combine different tools and um, mesh them together, create our own hybrid system. And I think it, it works because it shows the imperfections in a different way that allow people to see maybe some other parts of the technologies that they hadn't before. Well, that's a good point. What do you want? If, if I go or if anyone goes and watches the live mm -hmm. performance, what do you want them to leave with? 
Um, I want them to leave with a sense of people gathering together for and actually using a space for making something happen. I mean, part of the other thing that we do with our show is and why we even care about it being on TV and what TV means anymore. So many people watch TV on their computer, you know. Yeah. Um, we have the show air in Manhattan, and we really try to have people gather together in a, you know, a bar there and like watch it together. We want people to gather. Big right. screen or just regular what, bar TV? Whatever screen you <laughs> have. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we, we're running out of yes. time here. Obviously, ESP TV is, is a main attraction, but we have we have archives and we have architecture, yes. so, we have so all sorts so of things. The opening is from 6:30 to 8:30, and we have, if I run down the uh, list here, we have unfixed new paintings. We have Taiping a phenomenal artist from China um, doing a, an exhibition called Follow My Line. Uh, we all ha also have recent acquisitions from um, the museum as an archive. And we also have the architecture of Glenn Murcutt that actually was co-designed with the School of Design and Architecture students. And finally, we also have another um, exhibition of GIF from the Armstrong Pryor um, archive. Okay, and we'll stop you right there. Okay, no Sounds problem. fascinating. Yes, uh, it's be fantastic. Congratulations and good luck and we appreciate Thank you being here. That's it for now, I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us, you have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.